Uh, so, WordPress Developer's Guide to Quiching, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, caching, caching, uh, uh, what is it, uh, caching? Uh, <laughs> lots of ways to mispronounce, right? Um, so, yeah, so what is caching? <clears throat> In its uh, simplest form, it is just a temporarily storing some sort of resource uh, so that future requests uh, can be made faster, um, which brings me to my breakfast. Um, so basically, every morning I like to eat three eggs, uh, make a nice little omelet, um, put a lot of ingredients in there, right? I put some spinach, maybe some mushrooms, tomatoes, that kind of thing. Uh, ultimately, I cache every day uh, my food, right? So. Uh, all I'm doing is I'm going to the store and I buy my stuff in bulk and I put it in a fridge, I put it in a pantry, I put it in a freezer, um, and I basically store those resources temporarily in a location where I can get to them faster because I do not want to make a trip to the store every morning for all of the ingredients uh, so I can make my omelet. Uh, so in a sense, we all do this every day. Um, we just may not think about it in the same way, right? Uh, so every time you go to the grocery store, you're caching. Um, and every time you put that thing in your pantry or wherever, uh, that's essentially the same idea. So all you're doing in the digital space is the same type of thing. Um, so that's one of the, the <coughs> key aspects of it is just understanding that. Uh, another key aspect of caching is the idea of invalidation, right? Uh, so this is the act of expiring some sort of cached resource, right? Uh, and we all experience this in real life as well, right? Uh, so we buy milk. Uh, it has some sort of use by date. Maybe it's a, uh, you know, you get the, you go to the store and you get the use by or the sell by or the best if sold uh, or, or what is it, best if used by. Um, all right, well, and then the actual expiration date, right? Uh, but those are kind of just rough dates, right? Like they're not hard and fast. Um, and so it's kind of like the milk, you know, you get it. Uh, depends on whether you store it in the door or in the back of the fridge, how many times you open that door, uh, whether somebody actually left it out. Um, you know, and sometimes it can taste horrible and smell fine, and sometimes it smells horrible, uh, and it always tastes bad in that case. But um, so, you know, so we kind of run into these situations where like, well, how do you tell if milk is bad? Well, you know, you can use the baking soda method and put the baking soda on a plate and dump the milk on there, and if it uh, interacts, then it's no good. You put it in the microwave and you heat it up and it becomes something other than liquid, it's no good. Um, you know, we have all these kind of interesting things you can do to figure out whether milk is bad. Same thing happens with the digital space, right? So uh, we have this data and ideally uh, that data is still valid. It may not be valid, you know, uh, after some event takes place, maybe some uh, remote source has updated uh, your Twitter account or maybe uh, you've updated a post or somebody commented on that post. Uh, and all of these things could potentially expire your uh, data, um, but it just depends on kind of what's going on and how your data interacts with the rest of the world, right? Uh, so a lot of times uh, it's standard to put some sort of expiration date on it, uh, but that date could be valid. It could have long expired based off of some data change uh, or whatnot. So we have to just be careful about uh, invalidating things um, when maybe they are still good for another week. Uh, you never know, right? <coughs> so, uh, and then we have cache busting, which is another thing we hear a lot when we hear caching, right? Uh, so cache busting is basically uh, forcing a cache to load a new resource. In this case, that's the act of throwing the milk out and let's go buy some more. Um, and uh, so getting to actual code here, uh, one way that you'll probably see cache busting, uh, particularly Gutenberg does this. Um, so if you are enqueuing some sort of style or uh, script in WordPress, uh, you give it a handle um, and then you give it a URL where that uh, resource can be found. Uh, and you also def uh, define any uh, dependencies. In this case, there's an empty array for that. And then you have some sort of uh, cache busting. This is usually a version number. So <coughs> every time WordPress updates all the scripts inside of WordPress, they get a new version number that corresponds to the version of 
WordPress, right? So every time you update WordPress, uh, whatever the old versions of the scripts that released with that version of WordPress, um, those will get a new version when you update. And what that will do is it will automatically ensure that if you have these JavaScript files cached on a CDN or somewhere else, um, that those things will be flushed, essentially, or busted, uh, because this new version number indicates that this is a different uh, URL resource, right? It would append a question mark version equals to the end of the URL, and that would force that resource to load uh, a new one. Uh, so this is a common approach is to essentially have the, uh, in a plugin, you'd use plugins URL. Uh, in a uh, theme, you'd use uh, style sheet uh, URI or something like that. Um, and then uh, ultimately, uh, for the version number, what we're doing here is just saying uh, file m time, which is a PHP function. Uh, let's check to see if the uh, modified uh, timestamp essentially associated with that file has changed. And if it has, uh, let's use that as our version number. So that basically ensures that if you deploy a new version of said CSS file to the uh, server, then that modification time would change. And then this would essentially have a new version number. Uh, and then that would ensure that the, the resource is loaded. So uh, that's cache busting. Um, so let's take a look at the general types of caching that there are. So in a very general sense, uh, we have two things. We have one, which is the non-persistent cache. Uh, so this is basically where uh, in a given page load, uh, any resources that are requested within the context of loading that page, they are cached, but only for that specific page load. So they're not persisted uh, beyond that. Um, and WordPress uses this, and we'll go into that a little bit more here in a bit. Um, then we have persistent cache, which is basically where the data remains uh, in the cache across page loads. Uh, and this is more common um, and the kind of more ideal situation, uh, but we'll explain kind of how those things come into play. Um, so those are kind of the two general types, but we have a number of methods, and I'm not necessarily going to cover every single possible method, um, but kind of more the uh, most common methods that you'll see when it comes to caching. Um, so one of these is a CDN, right? So we've all heard of CDN, a content delivery network. Um, basically, all of your files are stored in the cloud, and they're served from the location that's the closest. Uh, and so you can kind of um, set policies as to how those things, how long those files should stay uh, in there, you know, when they should expire, and that kind of thing. And you can manually purge, and it kind of gives you some control over that. Um, so that's just a a tool that uh, is commonly used, uh, most people don't necessarily think of it as caching per se, uh, but ultimately you are temporary, temporarily storing uh, images or JavaScript files or CSS files uh, in a place, a location, server, closer to wherever your visitor is from uh, so that you can serve them faster. So it's essentially a cache. Um, so another one here is the browser cache, right? So Everybody has to use a browser to uh, navigate the web. Uh, so the content is stored essentially on that user's computer uh, and managed by the browser itself. Uh, and the user can go in and flush the cache themselves. Uh, but generally, there's cache headers and things when you make a request that uh, indicate or, you know, what things will be cached for how long and so on. Um, so. <coughs> So there's a browser cache. We also have the object cache. Uh, this is where essentially we have key value pairs. So typically we'll have some data that has a name and it is stored in memory or in some sort of persistent data store. And then those things uh, can be expired or forcibly uh, invalidated based off of uh, uh, other use cases. Um, so this would be, um, so the object cache would, uh, there's a bunch of different ones like Redis or um, uh, memcache is another common one. Uh, those typically by default operate off of uh, the RAM associated with the server. Uh, so they're uh, loaded into memory there. But they do have a limitation uh, in that 
typically whatever machine you're running on has very limited resources, only has so much RAM available. Uh, so I think a common configuration is somewhere around two megabytes of space for cached stuff. Um, correct. So that's on the server. So the browser cache is one of those things that you know uh, you can you can send headers and and ask for things to be uh, cached, but ultimately you know the user has to visit it and it has to be cached on the machine, and then it'll it'll stay um, assuming you don't flush it. But um, but yeah, so that's on the server, um, and then we also have page caching, which is where we take an entire page. And, uh, and store the actual uh, rendered HTML and put that into uh, some sort of data store uh, based off of typically the URL. Um, <coughs> and then in the event that some page is requested, it's going to basically shortcut the loading of WordPress and return the uh, HTML. Unless that HTML is not available, then it would consider it a miss and then allow it to go back through and WordPress would process as usual. So. Uh, so those are the com some of the common methods. Um, another one is fragment cache, which is very similar to page caching, except instead of caching an entire page, uh, we're just getting a segment or a section of the page. So this is commonly done for things that may require a lot more processing. Uh, so if you think of, um, let's say you have an API that generates some sort of output that gets put out into some section of the page, uh, you could cache just that portion um, and reduce the need to check that API as often. Uh, so getting to specifically uh, the things that we can do in WordPress uh, to kind of leverage some of these tools. Uh, obviously, some of these things are uh, a little outside of our hands. We can, um, I'm probably not going to go as much into, uh, for example, sending proper cache headers and things to ensure that uh, things get cached for a certain amount of time. A lot of plugins out there will just do that stuff for you, and if you really want to know, uh, you can figure all that out for yourself. But um, we're going to talk more from the aspect of creating a plugin. What does it look like to um, do caching? What are the different approaches? What are the ups and downsides of doing that? And uh, you know, what are the considerations? So, uh, so this is a function that I created that basically has no caching involved at all. Uh, so, as a good programmer, I prefix it with a vendor name, which I use, WP Scholar. Um, and the name of the function is get related posts. Um, and obviously, what it's going to do is it's going to get posts related to the post ID that you pass in. Uh, so, you start out with a um, line of code there that says uh, we have related posts as an array. It's an empty array. And down at the end, we're going to return whatever related posts we have or find. Uh, so all we're doing is we're taking a WP query, uh, running some sort of query, which I've hidden because that's not the important part, right? Um, except the fact that we're returning IDs from this. Um, so this query is going to return uh, a query um, object or instance, uh, which is going to have IDs as the post items. So we're basically just saying if the query has posts, then related posts is equal to an array of post objects or uh, post IDs. Um, so query arrow posts is going to be an array of nothing but IDs. And so those IDs represent the related posts. Um, and we'll kind of explain in our, uh, so toward the end of this presentation, uh, the last segment is uh, essentially different mindsets and things that, or things you need to think about uh, when it comes to caching. But so this is our uh, kind of, uh, what do you call it? Um, when you test and you have a uh, control. Yeah, this is our control group, right? So this is what it would look like if we did no caching. And then we're going to kind of have different, uh, different versions here that we take a look at. So the next version is essentially what I call runtime caching. So this idea of a non-persistent cache. Uh, so if we were to hit this function multiple times within, uh, within the code, uh, on a single page load, then we would consistently get the same results every time uh, without having to make the query over and over again. Uh, but that's all it's doing. Um, <coughs> the important thing here is uh, to notice that uh, 
caching is entirely dependent upon the information that's passed in, right? So if you pass the same post I ID in, you should always get the same data back. Uh, so uh, a very common problem is someone who might be implementing something like this would just say static queries equals um, zero or something, uh, or, or, or just an array, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they would do like static related posts equals array, right? And then say run the query and whatever the result is, set it uh, to be that static variable. Uh, problem is you pass in a different post ID, it's going to give you the old query, um, which would not be any good. So the idea here is that we have an array which represents the queries that have been run uh, for any given post ID. And so we take our related posts, we check to see if the queries array has uh, a post ID, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, index. And then uh, so if it does not, we'll actually run a query and set the uh, post ID as the key and the query result as the uh, value. And that way, if we run multiple queries, uh, each query just essentially gets stored in that array. Um, and because we have a static variable, uh, that will actually persist across function calls. Uh, and then so uh, then we'll basically check to see if the um, item that we just set in the array has posts. And if it does, we'll fetch those posts and store as related posts and return that. Um, so it gets a little bit interesting when we start uh, dealing with that. Uh, but that's kind of a way that you would do it with runtime or non-persistent caching. Um, and it works. Um, you know, so if you happen to have a very high traffic site uh, and unreliable other options, right? Uh, <laughs> this can work. Uh, so uh, the next option here is transients, right? So transients are a common thing that uh, people will use in WordPress. Uh, essentially what happens with transients, just in case you're not aware, is um, if you have some sort of object caching like Redis or memcache or things like that, uh, calling get transient, set transient, and all those functions will actually manipulate and work with your object caching that you've set up. Uh, however, if there is no object caching setup, then WordPress will actually store these things into the options table in your database, um, and that is uh, essentially how that will work. So uh, a lot of plugins will use transients uh, because they don't know what caching is set up, and uh, if no caching is set up, they can leverage the WordPress database itself to uh, store their information. So in this case, Again, we want to make sure that the post ID, um, whatever post ID we are requesting related posts for, uh, we always get the same related posts back, uh, at least until the cache clears and we do it again, right? So in this case, um, we're calling get transient and we're doing WP Scholar related posts underscore and we're appending essentially the post ID to the end so that we have some sort of unique key for our cache. Um, so we're naming are transient uniquely to the post ID itself. So there we have a query, and if we don't have a query, so in the, uh, in the case that the transient doesn't exist, uh, it's gonna return false, so query would be false. And in that case, uh, if it's false, we're gonna run a, a, new, a query, do the same thing we have been doing, fetching our related posts. And in this case, once we get our related posts, we're gonna call set transient, which is going to allow us to use that same cache key, essentially, so the same name with the post ID appended. Uh, we're gonna pass in our related posts, and then we're gonna uh, pass in, essentially, uh, how long it should be before that transient expires. So in this case, we're gonna just cache this for five minutes. So we're using the minute and seconds uh, constant that WordPress provides, multiplying that times five, and it uh, just makes it easy to read, and we're not putting some really big number in there that you have to then calculate. Uh, you said that at the start of the lecture, you were supposed to take care of the related posts, and you didn't Say it again. True. That's what I get for trying to do it in a hurry and not actually fully running the code. But yeah, uh, good point, yeah. So yeah, important thing is to make sure that you actually uh, store the same information that you are fetching. Uh, 
So, <laughs> um, but I actually, I, that's something I actually see a lot is uh, where somebody will take information, put it in a transient, get it back, and expect some very specific data structure, which is not the data structure they passed in. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good thing to check for. Um, so, yeah, so transients. Uh, so that's a, a common thing that people use. Uh, another option here is WP object cache. The thing to uh, note about the WP object cache, which is actually a class, um, but there's a, a set of functions that uh, essentially manipulate and work with that class for you. Um, they're very similar to the uh, set transient, get transient type functions. We have WP cache get, WP cache set, WP cache delete. Um, so these functions are a little different in that they do not ever put information into the database. If you have a caching uh, system set up like Redis or Memcache, then it will use that. If you do not, then it essentially does nothing uh, except for runtime caching. So this is where WordPress defaults, in this case, to a runtime or non-persistent cache. So that instance that we saw earlier where we were essentially doing that part ourselves and doing it with static variables and all of that, uh, WordPress will store all of the information that you cache, if there is no cache, um, just as a uh, runtime in memory type thing. It stores it until the page load is done, basically, um, since it's non persistent. Um, it does, yeah, um, because it was in memory for that particular runtime. Uh, once that runtime for that page load is done, uh, whatever was in memory is gone. So, um, <coughs> so. So. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a, it really depends on what plugins are doing what and how cache is configured and whether it's. Well. Maybe. Um, usually, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll figure that out later, but okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, some of what we cover in the next section might be helpful, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, so the WP object cache will use your persistent cache if it's there, otherwise it falls back to your runtime cache. So. Um, so in this case, uh, there's also a little bit more functionality as, as far as uh, uh, robustness, I should say, uh, in how you can cache things uh, beyond what transients can do. Um, or, well, I say that. Uh, it's just easier to use, I should say. So WP cache get allows you to pass in, for example, the post ID and then a group name, which in this case would be WP scholar related posts, right? Uh, and so instead of having to concatenate and form my own cache key, I can just pass in a unique value and then the name of the group, and it will find exactly what I'm looking for. Um, so it makes it a little easier uh, to kind of uh, group things. So this is how WordPress, uh, for example, caches uh, posts it themselves. So normally when you load WordPress, uh, every call to get post, uh, it would have to do a query to find that post and return it. Um, obviously, um, if we're using WP cache get and we don't have a persistent cache, what's going to happen is WordPress is going to 
somebody's going to call get post in their code, uh, it's going to trigger WP cache get. Uh, and so essentially when they call get post, right, they typically pass in the post ID. So that's what they're doing in WordPress. They're passing in the post ID and then saying, uh, you know, we have a group name of posts uh, and that's essentially how it stores. Uh, it stores all that essentially in, think of it as an array of information that would just be there until the end. Um, just needs to be unique. I don't think it necessarily needs to be an integer. Uh, so, exactly. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think the official variable names is, uh, well, I'd have to go look, but yeah, it could just be anything, I'm pretty sure. So, um, so yeah, so then, again, just like transients, if uh, there's nothing there, then WP cache get will return false. Uh, and then you can run your query, get your values, and then call WP cache set uh, and pass in your stuff and make sure that you actually are passing in um, the thing you're getting back. Um, and then you can set your, uh, your expiration. Um, with transients, the interesting thing is if you've set zero or don't set a uh, expiration, uh, it will actually never expire, um, just so you're aware. Uh, it can be helpful in some cases, but in other cases, not so helpful. Um, generally, I recommend that if you're caching something, you should set some sort of expiration date on things. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of the, uh, uh, another option, right? So there's evaluations to be made um, of which you should use, but uh, let's take a second and look at some of the considerations uh, when it comes to caching. So there's things that a lot of people don't think about, uh, so I wanna kinda expose these. So uh, number one, you wanna always assume that the cache is completely empty or broken. In other words, um, don't ever assume that you'll actually get what you're expecting back in your code. Always make sure that your code, if it doesn't get the value it's expecting from the cache, will go and run whatever it needs to to get that information or data. Um, so caching is an enhancement that provides better performance. Uh, and along the same lines as this, assuming that it's broken and you should always go back and get your data, uh, you're not, you should never use a cache to add some sort of functionality to your application. You don't want to assume that the data is there and that makes something work differently in your application. You always wanna make sure that if caching is unavailable, your, your stuff works. If caching is available, your stuff just works faster. Um, so again, always set an expiration. Uh, you're more than likely at some point gonna run into some edge case bug if you don't. Um, but uh, also be aware that uh, you don't wanna cache more than is necessary because there are limits. So I mentioned like some caching the two megabytes is kind of the default. So take into consideration, uh, I want to cache a uh, query uh, results, right? So I'm, my example shows that we're caching just the IDs themselves as an array, right? So that seems like the minimalist information. I can always use get post to get the uh, post for each thing that I need. Um, if I were to cache all of the actual post objects, I wouldn't have to call get post. Um, but at the same time, my uh, caching layer would have more information in there because now it's not just a number, it's a number, it's a post slug, it's probably a lot of other things I don't need or won't really use. Um, and if I were just to call get post for the thing I need, it's very possible that somebody else has already done it, it's already been cached and it's already there uh, available. So. It's better to get a bunch of IDs and use that uh, than it is the other. Um, you could do it either way. I mean, if you know exactly what you need, um, then I would say if you put it in the cache and it, you know it's not huge bits of information, it's a good option. Um, but if 
for example, you don't know or your application changes, it's probably more flexible to store the ID, get the post from that ID, and then use whatever you need from it. Um, uh, and the nice thing is if you have a post object that you get after the fact, you also have uh, uh, virtual properties and things that allow you to get meta and all that fun stuff. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so be aware of the limits uh, and think through how that works. Um, definitely don't cache the entire query because there's a lot more than just the posts themselves in there as well. Um, always make sure you test your application with caching on and off. Uh, that will help you catch any bugs related to the actual caching of things. Uh, and don't cache sensitive data. Uh, interestingly, if you made the rookie mistake of caching the entire query, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that the WP query object or uh, an instance of WP query actually contains a reference to an instance of WPDB, which contains your username and password for your database. So every time you cache a query in WordPress, you are caching your database login information as well. Um, so it introduces an additional security concern, um, which you want to make sure that you're careful. So again, only caching exactly what you need is an easy way to avoid that because you know exactly what's being cached. Um, so it's an easy mistake to make. Um, and ultimately, a lot of engineers don't even realize that. So that one I want to highlight for you. Um, Uh, so, there are, well, it really depends, I guess, on what caching you're using. Um, so, for example, I use local by Flywheel for my local development environment, and it automatically has Redis available, but not active. So, there's a plugin called Redis WP something or other, um, WP Redis, I think, uh, and you put that in, and it will automatically, once you hit enable, uh, turn the cache on. Um, and so then if you have something like query monitor plugin, it'll actually tell you when something was a hit or miss on the cache. So then you can actually load up a page, see, physically see something that says, yes, this, you know, hit the object cache or, you know, the object cache is in use or the object cache is not working or whatever the case may be. Um, so you know it's on or you know it's off. Uh, and that way you can test uh, to see that. Who knows? <laughs> so if you're active, you want the state to be active, right? But the monitor clearly says that the state is not active. So it doesn't work. Right? So on the front end, the end, hey, where is it? Is it turned off? Is it spaced? Is it there? So you can get it physically there as well. And the reason it does that is so it'll turn on and turn off. Otherwise, you're leaving the spot wide open. Well, that's more of a testing thing, right? So, um, so I've had uh, situations too where, um, let's say, um, so you get a plug-in or something where you've got uh, lots of things that are being cached, maybe a little too much. Um, and what I've seen happen is, um, so you have a caching la layer or something. You've got a, a post that's got a nice uh, mem cache layer going on, and uh, you know. And then I've seen uh, situations where, for whatever reason, that mem cache layer just nope, we're not working anymore. Uh, so now all that information, that too much information, which was kind of the cache was not being extremely valuable in the first place because it was exceeding the limits and then just pushing old stuff out faster than it was supposed to. So. Nothing actually ever reached the expiration date, 
it just got forced out and new things got pushed in. And so maybe like 25% of all requests were actually cached in some way. And then when the caching layer went down, all of those things went into the database. Uh, and so now we have hundreds of thousands of extra lines in the database. Um, and so now because uh, someone forgot to put uh, an index on the autoload column in the database, now the site is just slowing to a crawl. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting bugs and things that can happen related to caching. There's definitely not w one size fits all. Um, it depends on the caching. It depends on how the caching is being used. It depends on what's being cached. It depends on how much is being cached and all that. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of possibility in that arena. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, <coughs> I think transients is a good option for something that's publicly released as long as it's used appropriately, yeah, judiciously, yeah. So um, I think that there's definitely a use case for uh, if you have a plugin that needs to potentially optimize lots of things, um, there's kind of that top layer of things where it's like, okay, these are super heavy requests and maybe I'm going to use Git Transient for these and they're not going to overload things too much. Uh, and then, you know, there's kind of this next layer of stuff where it's like, if I cached all of this and there was no caching layer, I would just slow the site down to a crawl. I might use persistent or non-persistent caching for some of that, especially if it's things that are less likely to be called, um, that kind of thing. Uh, but maybe if they are called, they're called a lot within that runtime. So yeah, I think it's definitely being aware of what your application's doing, how it's doing it, and all of that. So yeah. Um, so yeah, and then uh, caching is one of those things where it's kind of a balancing act. So it's kind of uh, you know trying to find that fine line between performance and actually having fresh data. Um, so it's you know things like let's say Twitter count is the easy. Uh, use case, right? So you want to make sure that the number of times somebody shared this particular post on Twitter is accurate. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to hit the Twitter API all the time to try to figure that out. Um, and so, of course, you know, there's JavaScript things. But let's assume that we're doing this on our own in PHP or something. Um, so we can make a request to the API and fetch that data, and we can cache it. Um, do we cache it for an hour? Do we cache it for a day? A day may be too much, but it then again, it depends on how often people share your stuff, right? So it's kind of one of those things where uh, if I write a plugin to do it and I say, uh, you know, hit it every five minutes or 30 minutes or hour or something like that, it might even be too much for some people because uh, their stuff is, you know, they only care about it updating once a day. Um, so being aware of that, you know, there's kind of this balancing act and sometimes, um, It really depends on the user as to how that will pan out. So sometimes it makes sense to actually give the user some control over over how often or how long, I should say, things are cached. Um, so these are some resources. Um, all of these uh, slides are up on Twitter um, at the moment. Um, I also do this interesting thing where I um, have a QR code. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or you can go to the link there and get to it as well. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, that's caching in general. Uh, there's, like I said, a lot to it. So if there's questions, I think we've kind of went through some questions as we go. But if we have more questions. <laughs>
Uh, I forget what time do we have to? What time? 2.45. Okay. So. Gotcha. So we have some time. We can chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't used WP Rocket, um, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. Um, so, and there's uh, actually some of the web hosts even actually do that for you. Uh, and one thing that uh, I try to do is limit uh, the plugins I install and try to see if I can get some sort of external service to do some of that. Uh, and some of those tools can be things like Cloudflare um, can actually do some of the page caching for you. But um, I know certain web hosts actually will set it up to where they have reverse proxy caching servers and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so maybe worth looking into whether your host does. Uh, and other, of course, WordPress specific hosts, they actually have their own caching plugins and things. And if you run your own stuff next to what they've got, it sometimes can even cause issues. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but the other thing to be aware of too is that a lot of times plugins that do things like page caching, full page caching, uh, they do not take into consideration uh, things like dynamic functionality that may live on a page. So if you have a membership site or something where you're trying to show specific users specific information based off of who they are or what they've done, um, then that, that won't work. Um, I've actually uh, misconfigured Cloudflare, Cloudflare one time, and so everybody that came to my site saw the WP admin bar with my picture in the corner. Um, <laughs> not that they could actually, uh, uh, you know, go anywhere with that because they're not actually logged in, but um, the, the page response had the actual HTML and JavaScript and everything for that. Um, so they could find the links and try to go places. They wouldn't get in. Um, so, right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, conf that's where it gets to be important to figure out what your, uh, how you whitelist things and, and what URL parameters maybe you should take into consideration for ignoring all of that, and yeah, so e-commerce and all those things can be interesting. So. Say that last part again. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, exactly. I mean, if you're, if you're, yeah, oh yeah, question for the video. So, it's a very short question. Um, so uh, basically the question was if you're doing some sort of AJAX front end request as opposed to initiating the request from a back end, is there a difference in caching? Um, ultimately, I think if you have caching happening in PHP, it shouldn't matter one way or the other. Um, there are, I know, for example, when it comes to things like page caching, one of the things that uh, is commonly used to again, bust the cache for certain users uh, who might be doing an e-commerce checkout or logged in as some sort of member to a membership site. Um, actually looking at the cookie responses uh, and detecting certain WordPress cookies and things uh, is a common way to kind of bust the cache 
Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different ways that it can be done. Um, but yeah, as far as the front end, uh, you know, you can actually leverage uh, the browser as a cache. Uh, for AJAX requests. So if you're making multiple requests, uh, potentially, it, you know, if your application may or may not know that a request has already been made, um, then that's a problem because, you know, you could potentially make multiple requests for the exact same information, which has not changed. Um, so you can actually leverage things like local storage in the browser uh, and write JavaScript that will essentially make a request, store it in local storage, and then when it makes a request, check local storage first, and then, uh, you know, if it's not there, then call, uh, call the back end. Um, no, I think you're totally on your own for cache priming. So, yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, th that's another thing, a uh, whole other topic too, is the idea of cache uh, priming or cache warming. Uh, so essentially just think about the fact that, uh, you know, if something is cached, let's say it's a full page cache, for example. Uh, if, if a full page has already been cached for a, a static site or whatever, then uh, somebody hits that, it's going to serve that page up really quick. Um, problem is that when that page expires in the cache, then, well, the next person that lands on that is going to have to wait until the server does all its stuff and it's going to be a little slower. Um, but if the, um, the server is aware of when those things expire and it automatically visits that page before another user does, then it gets cached again. Um, and it wasn't the user who's sitting around waiting for that page to load. So it's kind of the idea of cache warming, right, uh, is that you... Uh, that you can actually have uh, fake requests, requests made by the server or some other technology that will essentially prime that cache for the next person who hits it. So a lot of times when it comes to things like object caching, if you've cached a WT query instance and you know, for example, that if someone updates the post in the admin, you're gonna have to expire that, you might as well go ahead and take the updated version and put it into the cache for them so it's already there for the next call. So by putting that uh, that extra load time in the admin for the person who made the update, uh, then all the other users on the front end will never experience a delay. So Yeah. <laughs> so Definitely don't don't cache WT query objects. Um, mainly because of just the sheer uh, size as well as sensitivity of actually what's in there. Um, but for example, like if you make an API request to Twitter and they just give you a JSON object, you know, caching that JSON object uh, works. Uh, and again, too, like you may even consider other options when it comes to caching. Uh, so WordPress obviously provides certain tools, but that doesn't mean that those are the only tools that are available. Um, let's say you hit an API, and this API has enormously large responses, and you don't know what you're going to use out of that. But you don't really have to make that many calls to it, but it doesn't make sense to store it in the database or anywhere else. You could actually just store it in a file uh, in the uploads directory in a folder for your plugin or something. Uh, and then, you know, based off the naming of the file structure, you could use that for caching and then you could have some functionality that would clear it uh, when it makes new requests or something like that. Uh, and so there's a lot more that you can do beyond what WordPress provides. Um, and there's obvi obviously a lot of other technology that I probably don't even know about. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's being aware of how it works and just kind of some of the options that are available that WordPress provides as well as, um, you know, being creative, I guess. Uh, so. Any other questions, comments, things I didn't cover or may not know about? 
So yeah, so the video um, <coughs> plugin called WP Cache or Rest Cache, um, yeah, which will basically um, allow you to set headers and different things for so forth. Got you. So just looking at the code and figuring out some of the headers and whatnot. Um, so I guess in some cases you may want to cache certain REST API calls, in other cases you may not want to, depending on the data but yeah so <coughs> yeah, and again for the video. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so there is the, uh, in the Gutenberg project, which uh, all the packages they have in there, they're, uh, they're on NPM with, for the WordPress organization, and they get put into WordPress core, uh, and they're there now. Um, so there's the data package, uh, WP data, which will allow you to, it's essentially a wrapper around the Redux uh, data store uh, with some customizations by WordPress itself um, to allow you to actually create your own uh, inside of, of the data store that they have. Um, so, yeah, have it for JavaScript applications, it's really good for uh, managing global state. So if you make multiple requests, you can essentially, you know, uh, create an array inside your data store where, you know, the key is maybe the ID or whatever of the thing you requested and the response is, uh, the value. Um, so uh, some people make the mistake of trying to nest data in JavaScript data stores. Um, keeping a flat structure makes it a whole lot easier to work with. Um, but there are also some JavaScript packages which will, um, uh, if you're using like a, a normal just plain Redux store and doing some React stuff, they have packages that kind of wrap the Redux uh, data store and automatically handle uh, persisting things to the local uh, browser cache or browser uh, local storage. So uh, there's a lot of interesting projects and things out there that'll make it a lot easier. Um, only downside to local storage is if the user opens an incognito window or a different browser, then none of that's there, but as long as they use the same browser, uh, you're good. So. What's that? Or yeah, they could flush it, I guess. But. Cool. Well, I guess that's uh, that's it for me. Appreciate it. <laughs>